السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله all praise is indeed due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his entire household all his companions and when I say his entire household we need to think of the names of the people whom we are referring to so the household would include his wives and his children and his grandchildren etc may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all his companions so many names come to mind mashallah starting with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu Umar al-Farooq radiallahu anhu Uthman radiallahu anhu and so many more May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and bless every one of us. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, it's important for us to know why we are on earth. Why did Allah make us? Why are we here? What does Allah want from me? Why does He take people away after a short stint on earth? Some people live for a few years, they die in their infancy, childhood, teenage some people slightly after that some people in their 40s 50s and very few would go beyond perhaps 80 very few in fact i don't know of many who have clocked 100 in our times in our communities so it means we are here for a short period of time we're going no matter what you've done on earth you leave it on earth besides your deeds you take your deeds with you when you came to the earth, you had no clothing. When you leave, you shall have no clothing. Remember that. When you came to the earth, you had no money. When you leave, you will have no money. How you spent whatever money came next to your name after you were born, that is how or those are the deeds that you have done that will follow through into the akhirah. But whatever change you have, you leave it behind. Yesterday I read a news piece of a librarian in America who left behind millions of dollars, millions of dollars for the library that he worked in. He didn't want to give his brothers or anyone. He wasn't married and he didn't want to give any family members, etc. He left behind the millions and they say he didn't used to spend money, but he was rich. What's the point? We are taught spend it while you're alive on a good course. You don't have to wait till you're dead and then write when I die, if I leave behind X amount, then I'd like it to go here and there. You know what? While you're alive, you have the money, sadaqah. That's what it is. Did you know something very interesting? The hadith says, إِذَا مَاتَ بْنُ آدَمًا قَطَ عَنْهُ عَمَلْهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثٍ When a son of Adam, meaning a human being, passes away, the deeds are cut. Besides three things. Listen carefully because many of us don't realize exactly what it is. It says, a charity that is continuous, sadaqatun jariya. That's what we call it. What is a sadaqatun jariya? Have you thought about it? Something you did in your life such that its benefit continues after you die. That is the true meaning of sadaqatun jariya. I hope you're listening. Something you did in your life, you drilled a borehole, you perhaps helped people, educated them. In fact, the second part of the hadith says, Ilmun yuntafa'u bih. Knowledge that you taught someone. Knowledge that you taught someone that they will then benefit from. Maybe you didn't teach them yourself because you didn't have it, but you gave them CDs. You facilitated the learning for them through maybe a mobile app, through perhaps a CD, a disc, whatever else it is. You facilitated that. That is knowledge you left behind. Who left it? You. Anyone who benefits from it up to Qiyamah, the reward will come to you. The third thing is, وَلَدٌ صَالِحٌ يَدْعُ لَهُ Children who will make dua for you, or a child who will make dua for you. Which means you brought up someone in such a way that when you die, at least they say, Oh Allah, forgive my father. Oh Allah, forgive my mother. Because they had a decent upbringing. 
So you invested by giving them a good upbringing. You taught them good manners. You taught them to have a good heart. Even if you have, and this is something interesting again, we have little squabbles now and again, society, community, the adults sometimes, you know, we behave like children. Sadly, shaitan makes us behave like children. But let's not let it seep to the next generation because it becomes worse. Wallahi, when you have a problem, Islam teaches you to sort it out today, not tomorrow. Shaitan may delay it. We all are guilty of falling into the trap of shaitan, myself included. But we are constantly reminded, try to sort it out ASAP as soon as possible. Why? The longer you leave it, the deeper the cut. The deeper the cut, the more difficult it will be to heal the wound. Simple. It will go to the next generation. It will become so ugly. And it will go to the following generation and you have two different societies and communities all together. Yet three generations up, they were brothers. This is why when you have a problem, sort it out with a big heart. Yes, when justice is being, for example, negated or ignored completely, there's an issue that we face a lot of the times. People come to us. People come to you, to anyone. Listen, brother, forgive him. Don't worry. Have a big heart. My brother, it's right. He stole 100,000 of mine. If you're ready to give me, I can forgive him. Simple as that. You cannot keep on telling me to forgive him. Five bucks, I can forgive him. Ten bucks, it's okay. He took it once, it's fine. Second time, what about the third time? You cannot keep on telling people forgive, forgive, forgive. It's like in marriages. The, the husband is beating up the wife, or he's a drunkard, or he doesn't read his salah, or he's not interested in Allah at all. And there is a detriment to the upbringing of the children. The wife has a right to seek nullification. Did you know that? The wife has a right to seek nullification. And I always say, and recently I discussed it on a very high level, to say the ulama, don't make it difficult for her to get that nullification. If she has the grounds, don't waste time. Your wasting of time is giving the bad image of Islam to the rest of the world. They thinking that Islam is oppressing the women. Yet it's the ulama delaying justice. You cannot keep on telling a woman, forgive him, stay. Forgive him, stay. Forgive him, stay. That sounds like a broken record now. Somewhere, somehow, something. You have to stop. When the ulama nullify a marriage, it's one talaq. It's not two or three. You can get back together again with a new nikah. There's no harm. It's not such a big deal, to be honest with you, as we make it out to be. If there is oppression and injustice, it has to be given. It is her right to nullify the thing. It's Islamically, it's the right. It's the only faith on earth that honors a woman such that she doesn't have to struggle for it. If she has reason for it, it's given. The problem is us who delay. Forgive, forgive. We can forgive you once, twice. How long do you want me to keep on forgiving you? Okay, that having been said, still, we try to resolve our matters. Try your best to forgive. Don't hold a grudge. Even if a divorce has happened, be mature about it. Be mature. Don't become ugly about it. It's divorce, it's over. You have children, whatever Allah has decided, this party will get access, that party will get custody, or vice versa. Surrender to it. Your life will be made smooth. When you hold a grudge, your, your, your back becomes heavy, so heavy that it's a burden on your own health. You can't take it anymore because you are oppressing yourself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Obviously, that was just a slight deviation from my topic, but it was an important point. Going back to these three things that are beneficial. Number one, we said a charity that you give in your life that will continue. For example, uh, you printed books. You might have drilled a borehole somewhere. You might have renovated a masjid or built a masjid or something of that nature. You will see the reward of it until Qiyamah. It continues clocking because people will benefit from it. The second thing we made mention of is knowledge. And knowledge is part of the first one, but a slightly different, uh, a slightly different department. It's also something beneficial for the communities and for the ummah. You taught people something and inshallah you'll get the reward of it. The third thing is a child who makes dua for you because you've invested in the child. May Allah make our children the coolness of our eyes and may he make them from among those who make dua for us when we pass away. The problem is shaitan comes to us and make us, makes us think that you know what? You have to just pass away. And when you die, then people will drill a ball on your behalf. Then people will build a masjid on your behalf. Then people will print books and distribute on your behalf. That is secondary. The hadith never speaks of that. Did you ever know that? I'm not saying it is valid or not valid. That's a topic on its own. But the proper isal thawab the proper way of getting yourself your own reward is do it while you're alive. That's your test. It's your examination. 
It's exactly as the following. Let me tell you. You go into an exam room. You have one hour. You write answers. All those answers are correct. You hand in the paper. You walk out. What happened? Who wrote the answers? You. And then the other example is, you went into the exam room. You left a few blanks. You wrote one or two answers. Some were right, some were wrong. You left. After that, your relative got hold of the paper and they're trying to correct it. You don't know whether it's going to be taken or not. You see? I give you another example. The, the fuqaha, all of them have made mention of hajj. If hajj is farad on you, you have to do it. There's no choice. You have to go. You can't say hajj is farad on me, I can afford it. But hey, you know, I'm still young. I can't think of, you know, quitting all these sins now. And hey, you know, when I'm about 50, 60, little, and I'm paying, my back is paining, my knees are a little bit this way, that way. Think of going for hajj. No. Allah gave you the wealth. You have to go. You have no option. You have to go. If you don't go and you die, it's a pillar of Islam that you smashed. It might not hold your building up. You get on the day of Qiyamah, Hajj, it's not there. Was it farad on you? Yes. Didn't do it? We don't know what Allah will do. May Allah forgive us. So if you have written it in your will to say the Hajj must be done, yes, it will be done on your behalf. Because for some reason you couldn't do it and it will be done on your behalf with your money if there was money left. Okay. But if you haven't written anything, and it was farad on you. And your children do it. Did you ever know? It's up to Allah whether he wants to take it or not. No scholar has ever said there's a guarantee of that hajj being accepted. The same applies to deeds done on your behalf later on after death. Nobody can guarantee whether actually Allah will accept them or reject them. You know? So this is why do the deeds while you're alive. Don't fool yourself. Do it while you are alive. Subhanallah, it's something amazing. So Allah created us on this earth. To be tested. That's what he said. I want to test you. We were there before we were born. We were somewhere. We were in a world known as Al Arwah, where the souls were living. How? You know what? The brain I have right now and the mind doesn't really comprehend or understand or remember. But I was somewhere before I was born. And guess what? I'm going to go somewhere after I die. Because the others have gone whom I loved. And the others have gone whom I was related to. My forefathers are gone. Subhanallah. I'm waiting for my turn to go away. To finish my test here. What is a test? Is it something easy or difficult? This is a powerful point. A test is a difficult thing. A child has a small test in grade one. They're sweating. And what are they going to ask you? One plus one. And they're sweating. Because the word test or exam, by nature, it makes man fret. Even if I tell you, listen, you have a driving test. You know you've bribed the guy. Sorry, you know, I'm talking about certain systems. You know everything. But at the same time, you don't know whether you're going to pass or fail. Because you don't really know if that worked or didn't work. May Allah forgive those who do that. But, you know, in some nations, that's the only way, some people say, to get your driver's license. No wonder there's so many accidents. May Allah forgive us. I'm not talking about this place, by the way. So anyway, you're so worried. That word test is a hard word. Allah says, I created you to test you, which means life is going to be? Say it. Life is going to be? Tough. It's going to be hard. That's what life is. It's tough. It's a challenge from the beginning to the end. When you were born, guess what they did to you? They made sure you cried because that's the first part of your test. I didn't want to go to school. You know, the little kids, they want to, you, you, you start them off in crash the first day, no matter how many sweets and chocolates Brother Ismail brings for them. At the end of the day, you know what happens? They cry. They cry. Subhanallah. My little one, one of them started, you know, a few days ago, a week ago approximately. And guess what? First day, excited a little bit. Second day, I don't want to go. Third day, yelling at the top of her voice. Why? It's a test. It's something. There's a comfort zone you were in all this time. You're now out of it. So the same applies to the souls. You were somewhere. Now you're in, on earth. You came crying. Guess what? You're going to cry all your life. Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. The tears you will shed when you're older, they might be less, but they are far more hurtful than those you shed when you were born. Remember that. Right now, you and I, we cry. You, I, I need to know. When I see an adult crying, there is pain. There is something big. Or there is softness of the heart. Different type of a tear. I can cry because I'm in pain. I can cry because I'm in love with Allah. I can cry because I'm seeking forgiveness. I can cry. So there are different types of tears. But all of it is related to your test. Don't fool yourself, oh man. You are not here to enjoy. But... As a byproduct of your existence on earth, Allah will allow you to have pockets of enjoyment which will not last. You got married, honeymoon. How long does it last? 
For some people, one week. For some people, one year. One old man told me, hey brother, 21 years, I'm still a honeymoon, mate. You know, well he's lucky. Just in the accent, I can hear that he's one of those cool dudes, you know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. The point being raised is, you will have happy days, but they won't last. Why won't they last? For Allah to show you there is something everlasting that will still come. You will have a job and you will be fired. You may lose the job. You might have a business, you made money. Next day you didn't. You were happy, you bought a beautiful car. Next day you had to sell it. You had a lovely house. The following day it was taken over by someone you owed money to. Thus is life. You were born for that, to be tested. But in the process, don't lose the, f the focus upon reality. Don't lose focus. What is reality? I can leave now. All of us, myself included, think for a moment. I can go right here, right now. Right here, right now. I can go back to Allah. Will anyone lose anything? Actually not. The reason is you might think, I got kids, I got a wife. Guess what? She will marry someone else. And she'll be happier than she was when she was with you, by the way. <laughs> it's just an example, okay? Okay, don't take that seriously, please. But it could be vice versa, you know? <laughs> but the truth is, Life carries on. There are people who've left behind children who've had beautiful upbringings without their fathers and mothers. Do you know that? They've had beautiful upbringings. Why? It was Allah's plan. The orphans sometimes have been more successful than people who are not orphans. Starting with Muhammad wasallam, the most beloved of Allah. He was so successful. What was he? An orphan. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Say that after me. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I promise you. So that's life. It's a test. And each one's questions are different because you cannot cheat in this exam. You can go back to the instruction manual and look, but you can't cheat. You're going to have to write your own answers. Your questions are separate from the other person's questions. Totally different. You need to know this. You need to understand it. That's Allah. So why are you on earth to be tested? Tests are difficult, which means life is going to be tough. You can be a president, you can be a king, you can be a rich man, you can be a healthy man, you can be a good looking woman, you can be a happy woman, you can have a husband who's a prince of whatever. You can have a king as a husband, you can be a person who's got everything laid out. Your life will be difficult. It will be difficult at certain points. And it will be easy at certain points. You have happy days and you also have sad days. You have days of profit and you also have days of loss. That is what life is. Allah says it is to test you. We will test you. I just want to say that word. Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says indeed, definitely we will test every single one of you. I'm going to test you. That's why you are on earth. Test to do what? Will you actually worship me or will you worship the devil? That's what it is. So there will be crossroads every other day. Multiple choice. Answer A, answer B, answer C, answer D, answer E. You need to choose the right answer and you will continue. And if you've written the wrong answer, there is a chance for you to go back and correct it. You might have to pay for that correction. But before you die, you would be able to actually tick off. You might suffer as a result of what you've done. I'll give you an example. A man proposes to marry a woman. Or vice versa, a woman's family proposes to the man's family to get married. Okay? And I'm giving you this example because it's a problem on earth at the moment. What happens? Because they are a different color, because they are a different race, or a different tribe, or perhaps come from a different land, a different nationality, etc. Someone somewhere somehow says no. But the deen is correct. The akhlaq is correct, you know, the character is correct, the religion is correct. There's no Islamic reason to deny. If the two are happy and the deen and the akhlaq are in order for you as a parent is nothing but to say, you know what, I'll let it happen. Remember this, it's not your choice. That child belongs to Allah. Allah can take that child away and Allah will take you away as well. Don't worry. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajul. What is the meaning of inna lillahi? We all belong to Allah. No one belongs to me or you. We, we all belong to Allah. That's the meaning of it. So if you, if you have said no, for example, what did you do? You answered wrongly. 
Now suddenly something happens and the two of them behind your back develop a relationship, which is haram. It's not allowed. But you squeeze them into a corner. We're not justifying it. I'm telling you of what has happened and what can happen. You squeeze them into a corner and somehow, somewhere down the line, she was pregnant. Astaghfirullah. May Allah forgive them all and us all. Who is to blame? Firstly, the parents, without a doubt. Firstly, the parents. Why? They followed something haram. They followed their wounds and fancies. They were worried about what society had to say because they didn't want to accept something that was not normal to society, but normal to Allah. Acceptable in the eyes of Allah. So when we worry about what others have to say, we have to stop worrying about what Allah has to say. When that happens, what happened to your multiple choice and your tick? You got a wrong answer. The answer was A. You ticked off D. Do you understand? So because of that, you were to blame. Don't come and tell me that you are not to blame. You share a part of the blame. The initial the root of it is yours. You force them into a corner. When she was expecting, what happened? She had a child. The child born outside of wedlock. Something absolutely unacceptable. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them. Now what happens? She makes tawbah. He makes tawbah. They ask Allah's forgiveness. They ask Allah to forgive them. And they want to change their ways. Will that tawbah be accepted? Is it acceptable? What's the answer? If they seek Allah's forgiveness, can Allah forgive a sin of that nature? Say yes or no. It's a loud answer. Say yes or no. Yes. Allah will forgive. But what happens? As a result, you've got to live with that child. You've got to live with the stigma of it. You've got to live with so much people saying things and whatever else. But Allah would have forgiven you, who knows, if you engage in tawbah. Like I said, we're not encouraging the situation. We're only giving an example. And it's happening in society. So my parents, remember, there is a lesson for you in what I've just said. Not only with marriage, with so many other things. So many other things. We have the halal option and the haram option. When we choose the haram option, a lot of the times it's to do with our pride. A lot of the times it's to do with society and community. What will people have to say? What will my relatives have to say? I'm going to be an outcast. Well, I tell you, leaders are normally very lonely. When you're a leader and when you do things that are right, you're going to be alone for a while. People will see you and start copying. Like sheep. Like sheep. I was watching a very interesting little clip of sheep. A whole flock of sheep, a massive one, that was crossing from one point to another. And there was no fence there. There was only a gate. There was no fence. Just a gate. So they could have all crossed. But because the first two, three crossed from the gate, all of those felt there was a barrier there. They all came through the gate. So there was a stampede by the gate because the rest of them wanted to come through the gate. Nobody actually went through on the sides of that gate. So that's the nature of sheep, you know. When one does something, the rest will do it. With us, yes, when we do the wrong thing, we find a lot of others following. Why don't we do the right thing? Why not? People will talk about you. Hey, this guy, you know what? He got his child married. I'm sorry for talking about marriage again, but it's an example that comes to mind. He got his child married to so and so. They'll talk. It's called a seven day wonder. They'll talk for seven days. After that, they'll say, wow, well done. It was done okay, you know. Guess what? My child's got the same issue. I'm going to follow what that guy did. There you are. It started. You started a correct trend. Something correct. But if you don't start it, if you're worried about society, you live in depression, she lives in depression, wife lives in depression, granny, grandpa live in depression on both sides. So that's four grannies and grandpas if you count them. And so many people are all depressed. They're all on... Uh, what do you call those antidepressants and all other medication and sleeping pills and they get sick and they get further sick all because one thing you didn't do it correctly one thing you were worried about society Allah says hang on you pay for it first while you're alive by suffering more subhanallah it's their life bismillah let it go may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us so as I said life is a test Allah gives us test after test Right now, and I've been saying this, sorry, for a few years. Right now, we're going through financial difficulty in this country. Haven't you heard that for the last 10, 12 years? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. We're going through difficulty. Wallahi, it's a fact, right? Nobody can deny that. But some people resort to haram means to earn. Allah will give you. But you failed your test. Because why? You did it through the haram way. 
There's a halal way. Allah might not give you that much because He wants you to realize that this is a test. In order to do the right thing, you are going to need to run the whole marathon. You know, like there's a marathon. It's 90 kilometers, for example. And you know a shortcut. You know a shortcut. So you, you only need to run about 40, 40 k's, but you're going to go because it goes round. You're going to actually, you know, cut onto the side and run less. And then you're going to come out just before the finish line and pretend like you won. The day you caught, you're dead. It's like the people who take these uh, prohibited substances in order to enhance their performance in a race. They'll win the race. But what happens later on when the blood results come, they are disgraced in public. They are banned. The medals are gone back. Why? You cheated. So you can get money, but through cheating, you're going to pay for it. It's not going to be. Allah knows. He's in control. Allah put the financial difficulties to test you. Allah said, I don't want you to have. You got a car, sell it. You got a house, sell it. Live in rented accommodation. Eee, how can I sell a house? It's security. So you're securing your home in the dunya by sacrificing your home in the akhirah. That's what you're doing. Eee, but I can, get, I can get a loan from the bank, from my house. You know what? You'll get the loan. It will be an interest loan. You will incur a sin for it. You will be temporarily happy. You won't be able to pay back. The thing you got with the loan will go and the house will go and you have nothing. Then what? You following what I'm saying? So Allah says the best thing for you to do, do it the proper way. It's going to struggle. You're going to struggle a little bit. You're going to have to run 90 whole kilometers. You might come out second, third, whatever, but you'll be happy. You finished. Do you know? And Allah is watching you. And Allah knows. So these are the tests of life. They will be every day. A day will come when you got to rush to the doctor. What happened? Someone, somehow, somewhere did something that resulted in my child being hit by something and they needed attention in the hospital. How did I react? Did I start swearing, shouting, screaming? No, no point. No point. I'll give you one small example. A glass breaks in the house. Who? Someone broke it. Make it interesting. Your mother-in-law broke it. Okay. What happened? The glass broke. It fell straight on the leg of your child. Cut. It's bleeding. You saw the blood. What do you do? Do you start swearing, screaming? If that's the case, everyone can do that. Everyone can swear and scream. And it doesn't mean when the first swear word you say, suddenly the jinn will bring a plaster. The second swear word you say, suddenly the jinn will clean the leg. The third swear word you say, everything will be okay. The leg will be in a bandage. That, thanks a lot. That's stupid, man. It's silly. Rather, you keep quiet. Are you sure you guys are okay? Wait, wait, wait. Hang on, guys. There's glass. Let nobody else get hurt. Let's see how serious the child is. Watch your own legs, your own feet. Make sure you pick the child up into safety. You gauge the severity of the problem and you rush them to the hospital or whatever else in a beautiful way with the dhikr of Allah. Seek Allah's help. Rush to the doctor. That's the most sane way of doing things. And when you come back, you don't start swearing your mother-in-law because she dropped the cup or the glass. It was a mistake. You can drop a bigger glass tomorrow. Can happen. But you need to, yes, if it happened one too many times, you can say, listen, be a little bit careful with these glasses. You know, <laughs> so there's a way of saying things. <laughs> but pass your tests. We all make mistakes. That's why we're here to remind each other. This reminder is powerful for me too because I know in life, subhanallah, I'll give you an example. Driving to Bulawayo. So you know you're above the speed limit. You know it. And you know you're going to be stopped. I was driving with a brother and I said, you know what? The cops are around the corner here usually. And the fool like me, subhanallah, may Allah forgive us. Yes, exactly where I thought he was going to be, he was. Without realizing I was a few kilometers above. And he stopped me. He says, hey, hey, hey. You're cruising above the limit, subhanallah. And I'm busy thinking to myself, but I just told the brother next to me, this is where they sit. And look at me, I know where they sit. And I still got trapped. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Well, you might want to know that I got away without anything, mashallah. <laughs> I just gave him a little lecture and I was out. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. But the point is, we do that in life, all of us, where we know what's right, we know what it is, and still we're over the limit. We know it, and we know it's going to have a repercussion, and we know it's going to delay us, and we know it's going to cause a problem. My brothers and sisters, pass your test. You have different tests. Sometimes you have a test such that haram dangles in front of you, like a carrot. It's not because, ee, look at this. Sure. You know, one young man told me, this is a true story, okay? One young man told me, you know, 
But if Allah didn't want me to commit this sin, He wouldn't have made it so easy for me to, to, to do it. And I said, what? Are you okay in your head? If Allah didn't want you to commit the sin, He wouldn't have made it easy for you. Have you thought of something? If Allah wanted you to abstain from it out of your love for Him, he would, that's when He would actually dangle it. You know, a lot of the times when you make tawbah, when you make tawbah from a sin, say a man who was drinking, I'll give you a different example, okay? I hope it's not common in society, inshallah it won't be. Say a man who was drinking alcohol and he decides one day, you know what, these are the 10 days of the hijjah, powerful days, beautiful days, the most blessed days in the whole year. I'm sure you've heard that. These are the most blessed days in the whole year. Do you know that? The 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. You might be scratching your head and say, but I thought it was Ramadan. Hang on. Ramadan is the nights. Dhul Hijjah is the days. There's a difference between the two. Laylatul Qadr is the most powerful night. Okay, you have the nights of Eid. You have the nights of the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Those are the nights. These 10 days, it's the days. It's the days. So there's a difference. These are powerful days. So the man says, I'm going to make tawbah. And he sits and he cries to Allah. Oh Allah, forgive me. I regret. I admit my sin. I'm never going to drink again. And Ya Allah, I will never do it again. Forgive me. Remorse. He gets up after crying warm tears. And he goes shopping. And when he goes shopping, guess what? The same alcohol that he used to really, really love is now on sale. Three for the price of one. Hey, what's happening there? Don't come and tell me Allah wants you to have a few more bottles. Not at all. What's happening is Allah is testing to see if your tawbah was sincere. We're going to put it in front of you. See, are you leaving it or are you going to go for it? A man committing adultery is fed up of it because it gets you nowhere. He says, oh Allah, I'll never do this again. And suddenly, things are facilitated. Once again, it becomes so easy and you say, ee, ee. Allah, but the day of Arafah is still coming. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> We're already in the 10 days. Don't do that. That's Allah testing you. This tawbah that you've promised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are you going to follow it through? What's, what are you going to achieve by doing it one more time? No, I asked Allah's forgiveness. Oh Allah, that's it. I quit. So these are the tests because that could be your last test. Allah might stop your heart. Your heartbeat needs to just stop once, twice, and you're gone. I'm sure you know that. I'm sure you know that. Do you know how many times your heart beats in the day? How many times do you think your heart beats in the day? A thousand? Two thousand? Five thousand? Twenty thousand? Sixty thousand? An average heart beats 136,000 times a day. Day and night, meaning the 24-hour cycle. 136,000 times. Imagine it just has to pause just for two, two of those beats, what happens? May Allah forgive us. Allahu Akbar. With each heartbeat, with each heartbeat, you should draw yourself closer to Allah. That's what it is. It's a miracle. It's a gift. No batteries. Eh? There's no batteries in your heart. You feel it. It just pump, pumps. How? I don't know. It's the Qudra of Allah. Wallah, it's a muscle that starts pumping even before life is in the body. According to Islam, the life is in the body at 120 days of conception. 120 days. But the heart starts pumping a few weeks in to the conception, the conceiving. A few weeks in, the heart starts pumping. The muscle is moving. It's a muscle that's moving. There's no life in the body yet. The life is only going to come at 120 days, according to Islam. And then that heart will stop pumping one day. The person's gone. Where were you? What did you do in life? Yeah, I enjoy it. Doing what? Sinning. Well, what's, what's the portion left for you in the hereafter? You enjoyed yourself in the wrong way. We sent you to test you. You failed your test. You know, my brothers and sisters, Allah's mercy we hope for. We are human beings. We are weak. But turn to Allah. I know for a fact, when you're a Muslim, when you're a believer, when you have faith in your heart, subhanAllah, you always have this concern within you to please Allah. Everyone, even the most sinful of people, if they have belief in their hearts, they want to please Allah somehow. They, oh Allah, you know my weakness. But stop. Stop relying on the mercy of Allah in order to sin. We rely on the mercy of Allah definitely for everything. But in order to justify my sin, I'm using the excuse. Now Allah is forgiving. Allah knows, hey, I'm, I have to have this. Allah knows, you know. Astaghfirullah, Allah knows it's a test for you. Come on, pass that test. So, 
as a gift Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us into difficulty now one might ask you said we are in this world to be tested yes that's in the Quran you said tests are difficult yes we understand that from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu so in life there will be certain days that will be okay happy days certain days that will be sad days and we live our whole lives in this way the answer is yes your entire life you will live between tests difficulties and a few pockets of happiness remember this pockets of happiness your entire life will pass like that such that the day you die a lot of the times when people pass away they pass away via something they would call or those whom they left behind would call negative what does that mean hey he died this guy died we say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. what was the cause of the death that's the question what do they say name me a few causes one he had a heart attack hey he was sick he was ill hey he had a car accident hey he drowned what are all these things for you and i negative if you have a heart problem you won't rest you're going to go to the doctor run from pillar to post rush to south africa go to honolulu wherever else but you need to get that heart checked because why hey i got a heart problem allahu akbar imagine man is so keen to live for another five minutes but man doesn't realize go today go tomorrow go any day a winner is he who passed the test i died struggling that's what happened i died struggling for what survival but in the pleasure of allah you succeeded in the akhirah this world ultimately is coming to an end like i said at the beginning you can be the wealthiest person you still have to die at some point now i want to divert a little bit to try and show that when Allah tests you, He actually loves you. When Allah puts difficulty in your life, He loves you. Why? He's giving you a clue for the right answer. Go back to my example. You went into the school. It was exam time. You went into the hall. The papers were handed out. The questionnaires were handed out. You picked up your pen when the bell rang to depict the beginning of the examination. You started writing your test. And here comes the examiner giving you a hint. What's the hint? Hey, this is the answer. Hey, you're a lucky person, isn't it? You're so lucky. Who's giving you the answer? The examiner. Hey, that's supposed to be cheating. Hang on, hang on, hang on. That's supposed to be cheating. But in the case of Allah, He hints to you what the answer is for certain things. And it's not cheating. It's a gift. So the example is you in the exam room. The question is... Uh, what would you do in this scenario? A, B, C, D, or E? The answer is A, but you are heading towards E. So Allah says, hang on, I make you sick. How is that a clue? Make you sick. I show you how it's the clue. Now you're sick. So what did you do? You still have the money, you have everything. You ran to the doctor. Doctor says, E, you've got to go for further tests. Way to South Africa. So you flew down. What's happening? You're spending money. And you went into the hospital and you had a further test, further test. The doctor says, we don't know what's wrong with this man. But his health is deteriorating. We're giving him six months to live. And Allah knows you're going to live up to 60 years old. But the doctor says we're giving him six months. Six months maximum this guy is going. Based on what's happening to his body. Now what happens? Now what happens? You have no option but to turn to. Even if you're not such a religious person. You have no option but to turn to Allah. So then you get up one day for Salat al Tahajjud. First time in your life, you never knew how it felt. You never ever knew how it felt to get up for Tahajjud. But you learned about it, you read about it, you asked, how many rak'at do I need to fulfill or units of prayer for Tahajjud? I don't even know how to read it and so on. What do I do? You got up in the night. Why? Allah's tapping you. You know what? You ticked off E, but the answer is A. What's E? You relied on your wealth. You relied on the doctors. You were going everywhere. You were sinning. You were in the clubs and pubs. You were gambling. You were, a, wait, wait, wait. We want you to know the right answer is A. Quit all of that and come this way. So you make dua to oh Allah, help me, guide me, forgive me. Wow, wow, whatever you want to say. I tell you, when you read the Hajjud, it's a sign that your other five salah are possibly, probably, inshallah, hopefully in order. Because that's a voluntary prayer. When I do something voluntary, that which was necessary is done. 
I mean, I've got a spare wheel in my car. I can't have a jack where the real wheel is supposed to be and think I'm going to drive off. Not at all. Do you get my point? If I have a spare wheel and I tell you, hey, I've got a spare wheel, that means my four wheels are in order here. You see? The same applies if I'm telling you I'm reading tahajjud or if you know you, you're regular with tahajjud, the chances of you being regular with the five farad prayers are, are obviously most likely. It's there, there. So what happened? You now got up for tahajjud and you started crying to Allah and you became a person who's soft at heart and you became a person, you started sorting out your matters. In your mind, you've got how many months left to live? Six. Hey, six months crossed and guess what? You're still alive. Reminds me of a guy. They say there was a king. And he was huge, you know, huge. So what happened is he really needed to lose weight. He wanted to lose weight. And he, he tried all the doctors and medication and everything. And the guys tried whatever and he didn't lose weight. So he says, whoever helps me to lose weight, I will give him X amount of gold. Or I'll make him my deputy, something big, right? So there was one of these people on the street, a wise man, and he was a poor guy. He came, he says, King, you want to lose weight, but you're going to die in six months. The king says, what? He says, you're going to die in six months. How do you know? He says, I'm telling you. The king says, are you serious? He said, yes, you're going to die. I'm going to die in six months. He says, I promise you, you're going to die in six months. And he went away. The king was worried. He believed the story. Guess what happened? He started losing weight. Because for him, what's the point? I'm dying in six months. He gave this thing away, gave that thing away. He started organizing his palace, his parlor. He started giving responsibilities to other people. He became a cool guy, nice person, talking to everyone nicely, seeking forgiveness from the people, preparing for the day. He's going to meet with Allah. The six months passed. On the day, he was waiting for the clock to strike. And he didn't die. He did not die. He was shocked. He said, maybe I made a mistake by one day. Waited for a day, he still didn't die. Waited for three days, one week, he still didn't die. Where is the guy who lied to me? Where is he? So he sent all his men to look out for that guy there. They found him and brought him back. The man says, King, you're less than a quarter of your weight. Where's my prize? Did you hear that? You are less than a quarter of your weight. Where's my prize? Give it to me. The idea here is, look how he lost weight. And he achieved something great based on the fact that he thought he's going to go. He thought he's going to go. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. The same way when we think we're going to go, we shed all unnecessary weight that we have. Because we know you want to go to Allah, you're not allowed more than two bags, 23 kilos each. That's it. You know the story with South African Airways. You're not allowed more than two bags, 23 kilos each. The minute you have 24 kilos, you are in trouble. You travel light, I'm gone. That's it. If you have weight with you, how are you going to carry it? You have a long journey from the dunya all the way to the akhirah. How are you going to carry two heavy bags? I'd rather just go with a knapsack at the back and I'm gone. Your deeds, I got, you know what, I got good deeds. Your bad deeds, a small knapsack, oh Allah forgive me, it's out. Everything was checked in no time. You know there's one narration that says, the poor will go into heaven well before the rich. And the reason is, they won't have much to, you know, here we call it Zimra, by the way. They won't have much to declare. What did you have? I had 50 bucks. Okay, what, where did you get it? Where did you use it? Got it from here. I did this thing with it. I did that thing with it. I had $3 change. And you know what? When I died, somebody just gave money. I was buried. Done. I'm out. Okay, go. Green route. The other guy came with about 20 million. Hey, where did you get it from? Eee, I forgot. Let me start. It started here. It started there. It started there. It's going to take you a long, long time to declare every cent. You know that? But I'll, I'll, the hadith says clearly, you're going to give accounts of everything. If you've done something wrong, there's one way of deleting. Tawbah. Seek Allah's forgiveness. Make it right. Give out sadaqah. Charity. What charity does? It makes right what you did wrong. It makes right what you did wrong on condition that you engaged in tawbah. You give out charities. It will help you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So 
Allah brings people closer to him by inflicting them, keeping them in something they think is negative. You got a problem. Wallahi, if you die after a terminal illness, it's the gift of Allah because you were preparing to die. Whereas some other person might have died suddenly. They didn't even know they're going. Here you have an old person and he says, you know, you, next year you come, might not be alive. Allahu Akbar. And he's sitting to tasbih, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, oh Allah, forgive me, oh Allah, forgive me. And that's his life today. He's a lucky guy because he was preparing. But a young man who suddenly boom and he's gone. Only Allah knows. May he also have gone with the shahada on his tongues. But the chances are a little bit less because he wasn't expecting to go. So this is why when Allah loves you, hey, there's a sickness that came. I'm giving you one example. Otherwise, financial crisis. Otherwise, marital crisis. Otherwise, problem with the children. Otherwise, problems with the parents. Otherwise, a community issue. Otherwise, a major accusation against you. Otherwise, rumors about you. All of this is there to draw you closer to Allah. In order to help you, write the correct answer. Oh Allah, I rely on you. Ya Allah, the dunya will let me down. My most beloved people to me living on earth will let me down. But you will not let me down. You did not promise that I'm going to have the millions on earth and the billions. But you promised my heart will be content. Ya Allah, if you are pleased with me, don't need anything else. I don't mind what the whole world says about me for as long as you are happy with me. I wrote what you taught me was the right answer. Whenever the tests came in my direction. This is life, my brothers and sisters. This is life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May He open our doors. May He grant us goodness. May He help us to pass our tests. I want to end by telling you that not all the places on earth are the same in terms of value, spiritual and religious value. A masjid is different from outside the masjid. Because this is the house of Allah. So while you are in the house of Allah, feel the closeness to Allah. When a masjid makes you feel nice and calm, when you come to it, because you have a small connection with Allah, let it grow inshallah. When you feel uneasy in the house of Allah, hey, there's something wrong. There is something wrong. Your connection with Allah. This is the house of Allah. Learn to love it. It's the house of Allah. Similarly, you go to Makkah, it's much more valuable than this masjid. It's also a masjid. But it has higher value. Who gave it that value? Allah. So when you go to Makkah, if your heart is not softened there, I wonder where it's going to be softened. Because it's a place of concentrated cleansing. Concentrated. One salah in al-Masjid al-Haram in Makkah al-Mukarramah, where the Kaaba is, is worth 100,000 salahs fulfilled anywhere else, including this masjid we're in right now. 100,000 salahs. If you can't feel a small bit of a change when you're there, there's something wrong, something major wrong. Maybe you just went shopping. And by the way, you made the Umrah. It should be the other way around. You go for the Umrah and by the way, you shop. It's not haram to shop. But it's wrong to make it your main aim. Hey, I'm going for Hajj. Did you get your shopping list? <laughs> Come on, relax. I'm going for Hajj. What shopping list are you talking about? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. You are allowed to shop. I'm just repeating this because just now, you know, I know there are people who love shopping listening to me here. You are allowed to shop, but it's not supposed to be your main name. You're going for Hajj. You're going for Umrah. May Allah take us all, inshallah, one day to Makkah. So, the places are different. Spirituality is different. When you are in Makkah, seize the opportunity. Now, the times are also different. I told you, the most powerful moments of the entire year. Who can tell me what they are? Most powerful moments. Can someone say? Laylatul Qadri Khayrun Min Alfi Shahr. The night of decree. Laylatul Qadr. Nothing more powerful than that. The night of decree. Most powerful. It's as good as 84 odd years of ibadah. Imagine how powerful it is. So for a person in Ramadan, in the last 10 nights, and they're not really bothered about Laylatul Qadr, my brother, there's something wrong. Please, please, please help yourself. There's millions of dollars being dished out in, in terms of spiritual dollars. But where are you? Your heart is not moved. Last 10 days of Ramadan, you're not even fasting. Come on, change that. I'm sure we can. It's a powerful night. What about the months? Which is the most powerful month in the year? 
Ramadan, no doubt. Ramadan is different from outside Ramadan. As soon as you see the moon, something happens. Do you know that? Whether you like it or not, when you see the moon of Ramadan, something changes. You pick up that spirituality within moments. You fast the first fast. When you are opening that fast at the end of the first day, there's a different feeling. Totally different. Why? Hey, I fasted for Allah. Something changed. It's Allah telling you, you know what? This is a spiritual month. It's different. We're giving you a chance. We're telling you. It's different. Come. If you don't, the hadith says, وَيْلٌ لِمَنْ أَدْرَكَ رَمَضَانَ فَلَمْ يُغْفَرْ لَهُ Destruction be upon the one who witnesses the month of Ramadan, but they still don't achieve forgiveness because they didn't ask for it. We're dishing out forgiveness. Ask for it. You'll get it. But you didn't ask for it. So what happened? We lost out. How can you say that? You were right in Mecca and you didn't make Umrah. What are you talking about? It's the same thing, but instead of a place, it's a time. It's the same example. One is you in Mecca, you didn't make Umrah. Two is you in Ramadan, you didn't get forgiveness. What's the difference? One is a place and one is a time. Similarly, Allah didn't keep all the days the same. The most powerful days are these 10 days we are in right now. There are no days of the year in which good deeds are more loved to Allah than these 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. So what type of deeds should I do? Any good deeds, dhikr. Tilawatul Qur'an, reading of the Qur'an or trying to understand its meaning, conveying it to others, reading your salah on time, nafil salah, fasting, whatever else you'd like to do. When it comes to the sacrificial animals on the days of tashriq and the days of nahar, the days of sacrificing, you will sacrifice. That is a beautiful act of worship. The first day is actually the day of Eid. It's also one of the 10 days. Go for it. Bismillah. All good deeds they are multiplied, they are more powerful in these 10 days. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make use of these days. They are beautiful. Cleanse the heart. The heart is actually the seat of government of your entire body. The heart and the mind, closely connected. The seat of government. If those are clean, then trust me, the whole body will be clean. The hadith speaks about it, about the heart. Allah wa inna fil jasadi la Indeed, in the body, there is one organ. One organ. If it is good, the whole body is good. And if it is bad, the whole body is bad. What's that? The heart. He says it's the heart. So clean the heart. How do you clean the heart? You have to actually learn to love people for the sake of Allah. That's all. I might have had issues with you. You might have had issues with me. Issues with me. But my brother, these issues are surmountable. We can actually overcome them. And you know what? I love you for the sake of Allah. We're not going to think the same. We will never. None of us are going to think the same. You can't think like me and I can't think like you. And I can't expect that. For as long as I'm within the limits of Islam and so on, and for as long as what I haven't you know, trampled over your rights, etc. Alhamdulillah. We don't even need to discuss that further. And if you would like to, because you have a beautiful opportunity to, you may without intending to actually make matters worse. But if a person has usurped your rights, you have the right to seek justice in a beautiful way. Don't let it become ugly. Like I said at the beginning of the talk, shaitan makes us make it become ugly. Shaitan makes it. All of us, myself included. Sometimes you have a problem and you know, you start thinking, oh no man, I don't want to see this guy. That's a human weakness. We need to work on it, work on it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. May Allah open our doors. My brothers and sisters, we ask Allah for Jannah al Firdaus. We ask Allah for Jannah. It's definitely been so heartwarming to be in this beautiful community once again. And mashallah, I've noticed some really positive changes by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've seen so much of goodness. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in goodness and to grant us further goodness. And to make us from among those who can benefit one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, selflessly, solely for the sake of Allah. You might say, why is this guy doing this? Well, there's no other reason besides for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you help someone, when you have a feeling for someone for the sake of Allah, it's your key to Jannah. Allah will continue to help you for as long as you are helping someone else. 
That's something amazing. That is something amazing. You want the help of Allah? Start helping other people. And you'll get the help of Allah. But when you want it all for yourself, don't expect the help of Allah to come. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Notice I tried to close from a few minutes, but I'm just going on and on. So now let me just close, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all ease. All those who are sick and ill, may Allah cure you. And all those who have passed away, may Allah have rahmah on them. May Allah have mercy on them. And the day He takes us away, may He be pleased with us. All the suffering people may be going through, may Allah help you through your suffering. May Allah help you through your debts to pay your debts. May Allah help you in all the difficulties you might be facing. May Allah protect you and grant you ease and goodness. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.